Hey, welcome to Simple Church Online. We are so glad you tuned in today. If this is your first time, well, we hope it won't be your last. Today we are in part four of a four-part series we're calling Responding to 2020 and Beyond. If you missed part one, two, or three, you can always go online to our webpage, our Facebook page, or YouTube and catch up. Now, naturally, and I say naturally because we're a church, naturally we look to Scripture for most of our information. During this series, we have also been using very heavily a book written by Christian author and pastor Andy Stanley entitled Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. And we encourage you to pick up a copy of that book for yourself. It is an easy read and it is an incredible read. Listen, I'm excited about today, but before we dig into part four, check this out. talk about something that I've shared before, but it has come back in my life in a way where I feel like God is really telling me, hey, you really do need to deal with this now. Um, so this message and the topics that we've been talking about every week has been very timely for me. Um, some of you may know I got engaged last month. <laughs> Thank you. And while that's exciting, that has brought up a lot of stuff that I have not dealt with in my past. Um, and it's brought up lots of feelings of feeling unworthy. Um, a lot of feelings of, wow, you know, there's a lot of really good things happening right now. But I'm also bringing another person into some situations that can be messy sometimes because of regrets that I have. And I have a lot of regrets 
and I hold on to that a lot. And what I've noticed is I've been kind of self-sabotaging myself because of that, and I've all the guilt and the shame that I've hold, held on to. Um, and one of the things that I found in my research um, through this church called Chase Oaks is they were actually talking about this. They were talking about shame and guilt and holding on to that. And how a lot of times when you're replaying your shame and your guilt, you're, you're listening to a lot of lies. Um, and how you need to replace those lies with truth when you hear them. So um, for me, this next song we're going to sing, you know, God's So Loved, it gives me this opportunity to continuously lay down this shame and guilt and regret. And I, I, in the past, I used to always have um, a theme song for every year. And so I know for me, this is going to be my song because I'm going to have to continuously lay down the feelings of failure and shame and guilt um, and so, you know, if you're one of those people that struggles with that, like I do, um, this is a great opportunity to start doing that. So we're ready.
your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world.
week one, we discovered that our choices, our decisions, our responses do indeed determine the direction and the quality of our lives. We learned that in order to make better decisions and have fewer regrets in life, we have to ask ourselves better questions before making decisions of any magnitude. And then after we ask ourselves better questions, we need to answer those questions and we need to answer them honestly. Because each and every one of us, we are writing our very own story. And we're writing that story one decision, one choice, one response at a time. Now, everything we've talked about leading up to today and every question we've challenged you to ask yourself so far, well, those questions, they related to you and you making your life better. But the question we're going to look at today is a question that it will make someone else's life better. It will make their world better. And it has the potential to make the world better. How many of you are familiar with the golden rule? I'm guessing most of us. There are multiple versions of the golden rule in both religious and non-religious literature. The Gospel of Matthew actually contains Jesus' version of the golden rule. Look at this in Matthew, the seventh chapter. Jesus said this, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. It's very interesting what Jesus added on, if you will, to the end of his version of the golden rule. According to Jesus here, his version of the golden rule sums up the 600 plus laws included in the ancient Hebrew law code. Now this is huge. I mean, is this crazy or what? Jesus did something here that we could refer to as raising the bar. All throughout his ministry, he was hinting at, and he was talking about something new, something new that was on the horizon, something new that was coming, something that was to replace much of what was in place in the first century. So many of those first century people were hoping for political reform. However, it appears that Jesus has something else in mind, something even bigger than that, something that would extend far beyond his earthly ministry. Once, as recorded in Matthew 16, Jesus predicted a new movement. Several times in Scripture, he claimed to be the end or the fulfillment of the current religious establishment. He even claimed to be greater than the temple. And that claim, that claim, if true, would make the temple and everything it represented to be, well, to be obsolete. Jesus even claimed to be able to forgive sins, which would end the sacrificial system associated with the temple. I mean, all of these crazy, bold, radical claims, they created a sense of, a sense of expectation, if you will, for his followers, and, and even the people that were just watching from a distance. When Jesus entered into Jerusalem for his final visits, people lined the street. It was jam-packed. They were so excited. They were so pumped to see Jesus. They had these political expectations, and they believed that Jesus could and would accomplish all of them. And Jesus, well, Jesus had their undivided attention. And then a turn of events. That evening, Jesus was falsely accused and arrested and taken into custody. But before he was, he announced his intentions. And this time he announced them in a very clear manner. First, he made this announcement as recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Jesus said, My children... I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. Now listen, his followers are immediately confused. I mean, wh where was he going? Why was he going? I mean, they were so close, so close to political reform. Why couldn't they go with him? And if he disappeared, well, what would happen to them? See, they knew what would happen to them. They would be hunted down, and they would be made to disappear as well. Jesus continued with these words. He said, a new command I give you. And they had to be thinking, Jesus, are you serious? We already have over 600, and it's just impossible to carry all of those out. And, and honestly, Jesus, earlier, didn't you sort of reduce all of those 600 plus to two when you said, hey, guys, love God? 
and love people. So are you changing your mind? I mean, Jesus, what, what's really going on here? It was hard enough to swallow the fact that Jesus had been grouping and prioritizing the sacred commands, and now he's adding to them? I mean, only God had that kind of, of authority. This is crazy. And then they began to see something, something very radical. Jesus wasn't adding to the commands. He wasn't adding to them at all. Jesus was replacing them. And in this replacement, he wasn't commanding them to feel something. He was commanding them to do something. And the first part wasn't anything new. I mean, they had heard Jesus talk about this before. But the second part, oh my gosh, this was crazy. And this is what changed the world. This was new. And, and to be honest, this was actually uh, blasphemous in, in the day. I mean, there was no getting around it. Look, look at what Jesus said in John 13. A new command I give you, love one another. Now they've heard Jesus talk about that. Jesus has been all about that his entire ministry. A new command I give you, love one another. And then he says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Jesus was saying, I have set the standard. I have set the standard with the way that I've lived and with the way I have loved you. Now, this was so personal to everyone around that table that night. See, they all knew him. They had left their occupations. They had left their friends and families in their hometowns. They left it all behind to follow Jesus. And Jesus had loved them. He had loved them well. And they watched Jesus love others. And now Jesus was saying, hey guys, you need to love people like I've loved you. I mean, they all sat there having flashbacks of the previous three years of doing life with Jesus. Matthew had to be thinking, man, I remember Jesus that one day when you came walking down the street and you locked eyes with me and you came over to me a wicked, no good, crooked tax collector who was ripping people off and you invited me to follow you. And even your followers, the guys that were already following, they, they were unsure. They didn't want it to happen. Jesus, you went to my house. You came to my house and I was there and my friends were there and we talked and we had a party and you interacted with everybody and you liked everybody and everybody liked you. You gave me a chance that nobody else would have given me. And Matthew had to be thinking, that's what you're saying. That's the love you want me to now show to people. That's the same grace you want me to share with everyone I meet. None of these guys were thinking in terms of the cross when Jesus said, I want you to love people like I've loved you, because the crucifixion, it hadn't happened. They were clueless about that. They were just thinking about the life they had done with Jesus, what they had experienced, how they saw Jesus live and how they saw him love. Jesus went on to say, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus said, there is one, one specific thing that will identify you as a follower of me. And that one thing, my friend, is the way you love. The way you love God and the way you love people. His main concern wasn't that they believe something. It was that they would do something. Jesus inserted himself into an equation that mere mortals had no business inserting themselves into. He said, loving me, loving like me, that's the standard. The standard's not the ritualistic one day a week, go to the temple and make a sacrifice. Following Jesus would not be about looking for ways to get closer to God who dwelled way over there or way out there or way up there. Jesus' followers would authenticate their love for God, not by looking up, but by looking around. Jesus uses his love to instruct them and to inspire them. This is what's so fascinating. Jesus never played the God card and used the authority he had. He just referred to the love that he had for them. Man, it, it's unbelievable. They, they, see, they would never see Jesus seated on the Jewish throne like they had all imagined. Instead, they would see him hanging, hanging on an old, rugged, wooden Roman cross. 
And it would be that gory sacrifice, not a keep your hands clean holiness that would compel them to take up their cross and follow him. In giving this new command, Jesus never once anchored it to his divine right as a king. He only anchored it to his sacrificial love. They were instructed to do unto others as Jesus had already done unto them. And then hours after giving them this new command, Jesus staged the ultimate demonstration of love by giving his very life. This new command, it was less complicated than the 600 plus other ones in the prevailing system. But make no mistake, this new one was far, far more demanding. And in this new one, there's not a list of rules, which means there are no loopholes or workarounds for this brand of love. Because, I mean, guys, seriously, isn't it true? If I give you 10 rules, you can usually find about a dozen loopholes, right? I mean, let's take it a step further. Give me the entire Bible, and I'll find you justification for just about any behavior you need justification for. Rules create, they create wiggle room, room for loopholes. I mean, come on, you were a teenager once, right? Did your mom or dad ever say to you, no, you can't go over to her house. We forbid it. You cannot go over to her house. And then you were surprised when they found out you went over to her grandmother's house to meet her and you got in trouble and you said, but mom, dad, you said not to go to her house. You never said not to go to her grandmother's house, right? We all have a similar story. I mean, and it's not just a teenage thing. Some of you have said to your boss, well, technically that's not in the handbook. I mean, I looked through the company handbook and that is not specifically in there. So how was I supposed to know that that broad statement referred, referred to that? This new command Jesus gave to love as he loved, there's no wiggle room here. There's no loopholes. So knowing all of this, let me present you with the last question that we're going to look at in this series. The last question that we are begging you to ask yourself before every decision, every choice, every response. But before I do, let me remind you of what I said at the beginning of the message. Everything we've talked about in this series leading up to today, and every question we've challenged you to ask yourself, those related to you and you making your life better. But the question we're telling you to ask yourself today, well, this one is a question that we want you to ask yourself because it will make someone else's life better. It's a question that paves the path to relational health. However, it doesn't guarantee the other person will choose to walk that path with you. It's a question that introduces inescapable clarity to just about every moral, ethical, and relational decision that you'll ever run up against. This question takes us right to the heart of Jesus' new covenant command, the standard by which his followers are required to evaluate their behavior their conversations, their attitudes. This question should serve as a guide and a compass as we navigate relationships and as we navigate life. It should inform us how we parent, how we manage, how we coach. It should form a perimeter around us, if you will, of what we should say and do in our roles as a spouse, as a coworker, as a friend, as a neighbor. This question gives voice to God's will for us on issues where the Bible is silent. See, it keeps us from having to say, but the Bible doesn't say anything's wrong with that. But the Bible doesn't say to do that exactly. It shuts down loopholes. It exposes hypocrisy. And it's so simple, but it's so inescapable demanding. Our question is fueled by Jesus' love as I have loved statement. And the question is this, what does love require? The question we want you to ask yourself before every decision, every choice, every response, what does love require of me? See, all of us are tempted at times to ask or wonder how, how little we can get by with relationally. The very thing that we do not want the person on the other side of the equation to even consider, right? The question, what does love require? It calls us on the carpet, man. When you're unsure what to say or what to do, all you need to ask is, what does love require? What does love require of me? Guys, listen, we don't need a chapter and verse. And I know for some of you there's a pushback to that, but listen, we don't need a chapter and verse. We have something better. 
Jesus' new all-encompassing command, do unto others as our Heavenly Father through Christ has done unto us. He did what was best for us, and now we in turn, we need to do what's best for others. And, and let's face it, truth be told, I mean, my opinion, I think 85 to 90% of the time, we know what love requires. I mean, we do. The, the instructions scattered throughout the New Testament serve as a real-world reminder. They serve as a real-world application of what Jesus' new command brand of love looks like. The, the authors of the New Testament, they didn't add to Jesus' command. They simply applied it to their readers and for us. Paul said when it comes to relationships with other people, be kind, be good, be faithful, practice self-control. Paul wrote that love is patient. And you know what that means? It means it's not pushy. Think through that. He said it's kind. And you know what kindness is? Kindness is love's response to weakness. It's doing for others what they can't do for themselves. He said love requires us to keep envy and pride from interfering with our ability to celebrate other people's success. He said love shows honor. It doesn't create regret. Love forgives. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil. It protects and it trusts. Love sees the best in people. And you know what? Love doesn't always require you to be right. But here's something you have to be aware of. The other party or parties, they, not, they may not be interested in what love requires of you. They may have no interest in what love requires of them. But here's the deal, guys. That doesn't change Jesus' command for you and for me. Living the way Jesus told us to, it'll make the world a better place. I mean, it will. And let's be honest here. We would love for others to treat us how Jesus instructed, right? Then why shouldn't we strive to treat other people that way? If we would just make decisions with others in mind, it would start changing everything. Over the 50 plus years of my life, my views on several things have evolved. And in some cases, my views have totally 100% changed. This includes, but it's not limited to my views on politics, on parenting, on leadership, on money, on marriage, on faith. And one horrible thing for me is that so many of my views have come out in my preaching and teaching. And there's hundreds of people, hundreds of people around the world that have or own an old cassette tape or an old CD with my opinion or my view. Now in this newer day, there's someone somewhere with a hard drive that has my opinion, my view. I, I always meant well, but life happened and I grew and I matured and I had kids and our family suffered tragedy and I began to see the world, well, I began to see it differently. And if I'm honest, there are many areas in which I still have no idea what I really believe. But guess what? Scripture says we all, all of us know in part, and we prophesy or predict only in part. There were things even the Apostle Paul and other authors of Scripture couldn't sort out. Questions they didn't have answers for. And these are the men and women guys who brought us the Scriptures. But here's what they did know. They knew this, and we can know this. 1 Corinthians 13 says this, Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. And if you skip down a few verses to verse 13, it says, And now these three remain. After all of those are silenced, after all of those disappear, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. See, we know what we know, but we don't know everything. We believe what we believe, but if we're honest, our beliefs, they're limited. But there is one thing that transcends our limited knowledge and our limited insight, and that, my friend, is love. Love fills all the gaps. Love reduces frictions. There's so much we don't know, but listen, our ignorance our ignorance does not ever impede our capacity to love. Never. The reality is, we aren't always sure what to believe. Our views on things, well, they may change. But we almost always know what love requires of us before we even ask. 
But I promise you, it is still worth asking and it's still worth answering honestly. I mean, do you want life to get better? Do you really? Do you want to get better at life? Then ask yourself before every decision, every choice, every response, what does love require of me? And then, well, do what it requires. Do what it requires. Let's pray. God, I pray for all of us that we would ask ourselves this question on a daily basis. Before we make any decision, any choice of magnitude, I pray we would ask, what does love require? Before we react, before we respond, I pray that we would ask ourselves, what does love require? God, I pray that we would love in a way that makes you proud. God, thank you for making this so crystal clear. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Guys, listen. If you're like me and there are things in Scripture that you're just, you look at and you're like, man, I don't quite understand. Uh, some of the dots are, are kind of hard to connect. W what's going on here? There, there's something that fills the gaps. There's something that fills the cracks. And it's love. And Jesus said, love. Love people like I have loved you. And I hope and pray that you will make that your mission in life. Because if you are a Christ follower, Jesus said there's one thing, one thing that will identify you as a true Christ follower. And that is your love. Your love for God and your love for people. Man, let's love one another and just see what God might do. Hey, thank you for tuning in to Simple Church Online today. We hope to see you again next week. If you'd like to make a donation to Simple Church, you can go to our webpage at simplechurchstl.com, hit the donate button and follow the instructions, or you can mail your check into the church at 1020 Anglem Road, Hazelwood, Missouri, 63042. Again, thank you so much for joining in. And listen, do unto others as Jesus has done unto you. God bless. Jumping the hurdles, getting caught in that rush of doing so much. I'm feeling kind of worn out, always checking the boxes, trying to be flawless. As we spin in my head and catch my breath, too afraid to slow it down. I tell myself to keep this up, that God wants more than just my love. But I've been complicating things, it's just like me to over. Gotta keep it real simple, keep it real simple Bring everything right back to ground zero Cause it all comes down to this Love God and love people We're living in a world that keeps breaking But if we wanna find a way to change it It all comes down to this Love God and love people Hold this freedom The keys to the kingdom Knowing life will be found when love can be loud Cause love is what it's all about I tell myself to keep this up All God wants is just my love No more complicating things No more need to overthink Gotta keep it real simple, keep it real simple Bring everything right back to ground zero Cause it all comes down to this Love God and love Rescues hearts and changes lives Love is all we need to make things right Gotta keep it real simple Whoa. It's really so simple